nine months is old. Nothing lasts forever. The young get old and the old get cold. Time marches on. I'd like to say, first of all, that I think you people, and I can tell by looking at you, are the smartest, <laughs> best looking, luckiest people on the whole planet to be here today. Because you're in the best place. Great food, great music, great people, great weather. And uh, we're going to have nothing but fun. We're going to cook catfish today. Now, you've had catfish, I know. Everybody eats catfish. But you ain't never had it like this. You know, when I create a dish, I try to build certain uh, components or characteristics into it uh, so that you have an interesting dish. Food, unlike many other arts or, or crafts, is something that touches you. I mean, you, you get touched so many ways, you know. It's so physical, it's so emotional, it's so mental, and it's so pleasurable. And of course, the eating part of it is the best, too. First of all, is, is there any locals here? I would do gumbo, so it's like, you can't do gumbo for locals, because everybody and their grandmother has their own recipe for gumbo. Uh, it's one of the beauties of gumbo is that uh, uh, everyone thinks they make the best gumbo. And I'm going to give you a little demonstration of mine. I uh, grew up in New Jersey, and I grew up in the Jersey Shore, and uh, my great-grandparents uh, had a farm. And so I was around a lot of food then, and then uh, my uncles and my godfather, so we're all lobster fishermen. So I moved to New Orleans, and I moved here for uh, six months, and that was you know, 11 years ago. If y'all are just joining us, this is Chef Susan Spicer, the Bayona restaurant in the French Quarter, making crawfish curry. I started cooking professionally in 1979 here in New Orleans at a hotel down in the French Quarter and um, happened to get real lucky and, and worked with a great chef named Danielle Bono who taught me a lot. It was a classical French kitchen. So at least I knew at that point. I was very grateful after having done many things not particularly well to find something that um, I seem to have an aptitude for. I was particularly fortunate, I think, and so I did not have horrible stories of chefs, you know, testing my, my metal and everything by making me, you know, with 60 egg hollandaise sauces and stuff like that. There are a lot of horror stories of what chefs have done to try to, you know, break the spirit of the women or to bring out their weakness or whatever it is, or to bring out their strength, depending on what, you know, what their motives were. I had a big um, philosophical debate about whether it's ever, with, with somebody, uh, another chef, about whether it's ever going to really even out or not. And I, I like to think that eventually it will balance out and it'll stop being such a novelty. Anybody who's just joined us, this is Lucy Mike King. She's a strawberry farmer from Hammond, Louisiana. So I live strawberry in Hammond. Farmer. I've been growing strawberries since I was five years old, and I'm going to be 79. How many, plant, how many acres do you plant? I used to grow about 10 acres. Now I have a half an acre. Half an acre. Because I do all the work myself. I do everything except the tractor work. I dig the ditches and everything. One man came with a big station wagon. He had a 12-foot ladder on the station wagon. Well, he hurried up and unloaded the, station, uh, the ladder. I said, sir, what are you going to do with that ladder? He says, I am going to get on it, and I am going to pick the biggest and the sweetest strawberry on the tree. I told him, sir, we don't pick strawberries like that. He said, well, how do you pick them? I told him, you put your head to the ground and you fan it to the sun. This is dirty rice. You throw it on the floor, put it in the frying pan, and there it is. I'm going to tell y'all a pretty clean joke, since y'all want to hear some jokes. I know y'all didn't ask for them, though. Now, Worcestershire sauce, 
What is, you know how they got this name? Anybody know how they got this name? Which show? Fellow was eating, and he didn't know how to name what he wants, so he said, what is this year's sauce? And they gave it a name, what's this year's sauce? Don't that make sense? My best friend for 45 years. No, go further for a coward. Make it 50. You steal it. No, 45. 50. Because I'm 61 now. You want to steal. And what will you be fixing today? Tell us what. Oh, today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a dish which has never been done. I mean, it never be done on the stage or on television. We're going to do a real paella like we do in the Mediterranean. We're going to do it right here with a big, big pot like this. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And how did you wind up here in New Orleans? Because I fell in love with the countryside, the people, the food. Oh, I thought you were going to say a woman. Liar. Oh, the woman, I like that all the time. Liar. And there yeah. was no woman that... that in my life? Do uh, you have any woman? No. No, no I no. said one special woman. They're all special. They're all special. Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 they're all special. They're all special. They, 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 uh, uh, I love them. No. I love them. Oh, mamma mia. Too much? Too much? What do you think, Chris? Oh, we need more. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause, please. Future Chef Ann Kearney of Paris So I understand uh, your background is uh, you're a sous chef for years. Well, being a sous chef is a lot more responsibility than being a cook. It takes you away from cooking, and I think what a lot of people get into this business for is because of their love of cooking. When you become a sous chef, you're responsible for making sure that your cooks and the people that work for you are, are taking care of their business and doing their jobs, because you're responsible for ultimately the chef has given you that responsibility so you you don't get as much freedom to play around and um, actually cook on the line I think you at, whenever you start out cooking you find your passion so we have the mystic herd of Nutria Mysterious wow. Mystic Herd of Nutria. Yeah! Celebrate the Nutria. One with the Nutria. Wow. Sometimes I like to, I don't know how to play no music though, so sometimes I beat the drums, you know. big part in my life. My, early on, my dad bought a business, and uh, it was a bread business that he bought from his uncle when I was about seven years old. And uh, as a result, I didn't have any way to go, nowhere to go in the morning. They would, you know, bread men would go to work like 5.30, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. My mom's worked in the hospital, and the, uh, she would have to go to work like 5.30 in the morning. So that was Lonely James with nowhere to go, so he had to go to work too. I, I've been fortunate enough to be in this industry now 23 years. And I took over my dad's business. And, and I took over my dad's business in the day, and I worked Shailene at night. And one thing about this city, which I think is like a lot of places, there's a story behind everything. I don't know if y'all smell it like I smell it. Ooh, it smells good. See, one thing about cooking, it's not like baking. We don't measure, so don't ask me how much. Now everybody say this is a, I have a secret, but nobody do it like the other fellow. So don't worry about it if you go home and it don't taste like mine. There's no two things alike. So don't ask me why it don't taste like mine. I, I don't know. I 
think you should remember that recipes are starting points or reference points. And once you look at a recipe or do a recipe, preferably, you can go any way you want with it. You know, use your own imagination. You can substitute ingredients if necessary or, or, or add different flavors or delete flavors. Whatever you want to do is just fine. And the most important thing you have to do as a professional cook is taste and taste constantly. It's a rough job. And that's going to be good. It needs a little bit more salt. So we have the dressing. I guess I'll think I want to taste it. Always taste, you know, use the recipe as a guideline, but always taste and change things according to your, you know, how you like them. Mm, it's good. Spicy. No cheese. Cheese, cheese, not too, <laughs> too much cheese is no good. It's expensive, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Grace, you win. Too much cheese. We put the ah! Oh! Just because it's expensive, here. Yeah. <laughs> Some capers. Cap capers, ooh. Capers. How do you spell it? C-A-P-E-R-S. C-A-P-P-E-R. P-P? C-A-P-P, no P-P. Oh, uh, yeah, two P. <laughs> And if you ever want to really get people's attention, you know, you're in the house and everybody's sleeping and you got to be cooking, and you want to make them think that it's, you know, this big grandiose meal going on, you just get a little saute going and drop some onions in there. And that'll wake them up quicker than bacon. And you can be as generous with the topping or as scarce with the topping as you like. And that's how recipes are created. That's why this is called the art. You know, you can create, you can add, you can take away, it's just like this dressing. You can take away the shrimp and the crab meat and still have a great dressing there. You just slide it off on the plate and you can go like that. Very simple, try margarita. One for me, one for you. I'm just kidding, they're all for you. <laughs> we got great taste, great textures, great color. And there you have it, fried catfish. <laughs> Chef Frank Brightson of Brightson's Restaurant. Thank you. <laughs> Chef James Baptiste, who opens the door. All that's it for you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Chris from La Provence. Thank you so much. We can't wait to taste. Thank you. Thank you. Have a round of applause from Lucy Mike King. Okay, well, let's have a round of applause for Chef Spicer. Let's have a round of applause for Chef James Shannon. Manners, Cox. Austin Leslie. Let's give a round of applause to Chef Leslie. All right. I love you. <laughs>